panelist here in Portland, and I'm going to be moderating this panel. Uh, so this event is going to be about an hour long, and we're going to start off, I'm going to introduce all of the different panelists, and then we're going to launch right into talking about Guantanamo. Um, rather than doing an opening statement from each of the panelists, I'm going to ask sort of a broad personal question that everyone can respond to. Um, and after we talk, we're going to probably talk for about 45 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to questions from y'all, um, and uh, that's, that's the course of the evening. Great. Um, so I just wanted to say that uh, right now I'm a, I'm a journalist with the feminist magazine Bitch, which is based here in town. Um, but my, I didn't think at all about Guantanamo until 2008 when I met a veteran who was living here who had served in Guantanamo, um, a really nice young guy um, at who we, we made zines together. And it was really surprising to meet him and to learn that he was a veteran and that he and I wound up traveling around England with um, some detainees who had uh, been detained in Guantanamo for several years. And that was a really eye-opening experience for me to learn about this whole world that was not on my radar before. Um, and I wound up working uh, this just this past year with a, a comic, sort of a graphic novel, non-fiction comic that you can read over there on the table uh, with Laura Sandow, who was a veteran of Guantanamo. So that's my background and my history. Um, I'm going to sit down while I introduce everybody else. Okay. Um, so this lovely woman is Laura Sandow, who is um, a U.S. Navy veteran who served at Guantanamo Naval Base um, in 2001 and 2002, right when, um, right when detainees were first arriving at the base. Um, and just this year, Laura and I collaborated on uh, a comic about her experiences in Guantanamo. Um, so if you're interested at all in, in reading it, uh, it's over there on the, on the side table, or if you can look at, that, at Symbolia Magazine, which is a comics magazine online. It's really great to have Laura with us here um, and to be able to talk about her experiences, which are pretty profound. Um, next to Lauren is S. Brian Wilson. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that's great. Uh, next to Laura is S. Brian Wilson, uh, who's a longtime activist here in Portland, also was a former commander of a security unit in uh, Vietnam, and is a trained lawyer, criminologist, longtime peace activist. And you might recognize him because Monday through Friday here in Portland, he does uh, he helps with a vigil at Portland City Hall to close Guantanamo. Um, you can check out the book about his life over there on the side table. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> and then next to Brian is Stephen T. Wax, who today is celebrating his 30th anniversary as a public defender for Oregon. Wow. <laughs> um, so he's the, chief, he's the chief federal public defender for the District of Oregon. Um, and uh, uh, you, I read his book, Kafka Comes to America, which everyone should definitely read. It's really interesting and um, like just absurd. It's also absurd. <laughs> so it's over there on the side table, too. And then here, up at 3 in the morning, all the way across the globe from England, is Andy Worthington. He's up there on the screen. Hi, Andy. <laughs> He might, he might leave us at some point in the evening to go fall asleep because, like I said, it's 3 in the morning and he's really going out of his way to join us here. Um, Andy Worthington is a journalist who it seems like spends all of his days and nights writing about Guantanamo. Um, his, his really great book is uh, called The Guantanamo Files, um, and I would really recommend just looking up his work. Just Google his name, Andy Worthington. He's the constant flood of Guantanamo information and news sources online. So thank you so much, Andy, for being here. All right, well, first I just wanted, the first question I had for all of y'all, and you should feel free to butt in or talk over each other, and anyone just take it. Um, but I wanted to ask about, this is an insider's account of Guantanamo. So what, from your personal uh, history or perspective or your research um, or your interactions with people is different about Guantanamo than people think it is? What's surprising about the place? or the people there, or the laws around it to you? What, what is different than we, think it, than we think it is? So just go for it. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe Stephen wants to start. Sure. What's different? Stephen, use the microphone. Microphone. Is this going on? Yeah. yeah. OK. <laughs> well, when I first got into these cases in 2005, I had heard repeatedly from our president, then president, vice president, secretary of defense, that everyone in Guantanamo was the worst of the worst. 
And that refrain has been continued uh, by not only the members of the former administration, but it has also been continued into the current administration, and it is a refrain that one hears repeatedly from members of the Senate uh, and other public officials. My experience, based on my personal interactions with the six clients my office and I represented there, and from my work with the group of lawyers around the country representing people in Guantanamo, is that that is just plainly and simply not true. There's no question, as I've experienced it, that there are some men in Guantanamo who could be charged as war criminals and perhaps should be charged as war criminals. But there are many men in Guantanamo who are either just absolutely innocent or were in the wrong place at the wrong time or were the equivalent of privates in the United States Army doing what they perceived to be the appropriate work for their government than the Taliban that was the government of Afghanistan. And working with my clients, working with the other lawyers on these cases, uh, it was quite disturbing to see how the public drumbeat of information about Guantanamo that has continued to this day is just not accurate. And I think that as people consider what should we do about Guantanamo, it's critical to understand who is there and who is not there. It's critical to read works such as Andy's Guantanamo Files, which is an account uh, based on government information about these men. And the government information itself explains and describes how many of these men were nowhere near a battlefield, were not picked up on a battlefield, how they are not accused of doing anything violent, how many of them are only accused by sometimes double or triple hearsay of having perhaps been in a safe house, what is a safe house? Having been in a location that some person in our government or some contractor for our government thought might have been an Al-Qaeda safe house. There's a lot of information available online and in print that I think is important to know, to understand, and to be able to pass on uh, because there are facts out there that can be used to counter a drumbeat of uh, mistruths, half-truths, or untruths. Um, Andy, would you like to respond? Can you hear us over there, Andy? If you're speaking to me, I can't hear you very well. Oh, yeah. Andy, would you like to respond? <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, you know, everything that Stephen has said is absolutely, um, absolutely crucial. And, you know, and it was very sad, really listening to what he was saying, which is such common sense and is not hidden information that can readily be found. Um, and, and to, you know, to have to reflect that after all these years, um, we're still having to make these arguments because the, um, the, I won't say it's the prevailing view, I think the prevailing view might be one of indifference, but there are significant players, uh, right-wing pundits, lawmakers, people with power and influence, still pushing the notion that, you know, hey, these guys are held in Guantanamo because they're terrorists, and, uh, you know, and we're keeping, we're keeping everyone safe, when, you know, that very clearly isn't the case. And certainly, you know, one of Stephen's cases uh, which I followed closely, and I'm glad to know that this man has been released for many years, was of a hospital administrator who uh, was actually shot to the Americans in Pakistan because he'd, um, he'd upset some people who'd been stealing supplies from the warehouse that supplied the hospital where he worked as the administrator. 
And, you know, that's how he ended up in Guantanamo. Um, you know, it, it's very sad that 166 men are still held at Guantanamo and that we're um, unable to make clearly enough the case to people who hold power um, in the United States and have authority that, um, you know, it has only ever been a handful of these people who are actually accused of um, anything to do with serious acts of international terrorism. And that the rest, as Stephen was saying, are people who were in the wrong place at the wrong time. People completely unconnected uh, with any kind of militant activity. And that those who were connected with any militant activity were, um, I thought was a very good way of putting it, were essentially private. These were the, the lowest kind of um, kind of military people who'd been told um, that fighting the Taliban against the Northern Alliance was the thing to do. And you know, this is what exactly what was happening before 9/11. After 9/11, suddenly um, it morphs into a, in a, an existential war against the United States, um, and these people discover that all the protections that were there before 9/11 are no longer there. So you don't have the protection of the Geneva Conventions if you're a soldier. Um, and more alarmingly, you don't have any protections um, as a human being um, if, you're, if you're captured by the United States after the 9-11 attacks because the Bush administration decides that people have no rights whatsoever. And in, you know, in one quite fundamental way, that's still the case at Guantanamo. These men cannot get out of that prison. Um, through any established procedure that we understand. There's no uh, end of hostilities that can elapse where they can be released. There's no sentence that they've been given. There's no trial that they've had. Uh, there's nothing. So President Obama finding it inconvenient to spend the political capital to release these men when faced, admittedly, with, uh, with opposition in Congress. Um, chooses to do nothing and is able to do nothing because there is nothing to get these people out of prison without concerted action uh, by the people who have the power and the authority in the United States and you know and that that's so disgraceful and um, you know I, I, was, I was I just find it upsetting really that the um, the propaganda that was that was pumped out by the Bush administration um, has been so enduring. Um, you know, my experience of the people that I've met is that clearly uh, these people were never terrorists at all. Um, and it's very easy when you take the bigger picture to, to see, well, well, why would they be? Because hardly anybody was. Um, I, I'm very glad that this event is happening tonight. Um, I'm hoping that it will, you know, help to spur us to find ways to keep putting the pressure on the Obama administration to uh, release um, as many people as possible from Guantanamo and find ways to, to finally, you know, close this prison down once and for all and to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. Because this, from the beginning, has been a situation in which the only reason that people ended up in Guantanamo was because in Afghanistan and Pakistan they ended up in U.S. custody. It is almost as simple as that, the exception of a handful of people who were you know, known and targeted, almost everybody was rounded up. This round, most, the majority of them, it seems, were sold to US forces by their Afghan and Pakistani allies. And we ended up in a dreadful situation where something like the witch hunts took place, the 17th century witch hunts, 17th and 18th century witch hunts, whereby the, the very, um, your, your presence in Guantanamo um, indicated that there ought to be a story that could be manufactured to justify why it was that you were in Guantanamo. Now, in various levels, this may or may not have been cynical. Um, people at various levels may or may not have believed that these people, these random people, largely, that were bought, um, had some you know, important pieces of information that they would be able to offer. But when Donald Rumsfeld said these people were the worst of the worst, he had absolutely no idea who those people were. That's how far from the truth it was. And what I think is really so sad about Guantanamo is that um, the process then rolled out of trying to establish that there was some purpose for these men to be there. And this is where the witch hunt 
to Manji comes in because when people in the, in large numbers said, you know, I don't know anything about Al Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, Naiman al Zawahiri, Mullah Omar, I know nothing about any of these things. I was never involved in any of these things. Then it was it was presumed by certain people that they were lying, um, and that therefore pressure had to be exerted on them, torture, other forms of abuse, if they were more malleable, then bribing them with better living conditions to get them to tell the stories that they wanted told to explain who these people were and how it could be justified that they were held. Um, and that's unfortunately the terrible situation that we're still stuck with. Um, when President Obama um, gets a task force to make deliberations about the prisoners, they're not basing this on, uh, on, on objective truths about these men. They're, they're, they're still um, quite credulous about this, this fog of, um, of half-truths and hearsay and lies um, that Stephen was talking about. And, uh, you know, and, and what we still have to do, sadly, is, is demonstrate quite how uh, the entire basis of Guantanamo is this, is false statements made by the prisoners about themselves and about their fellow prisoners, uh, all under extremely dubious circumstances. So those are some really big misconceptions that Andy and uh, Stephen just brought up about who is in Guantanamo actually not being mostly people that we thought were in Guantanamo or that the government said were in Guantanamo. Laura and Brian, do you have other things that have surprised you about Guantanamo or ways that in reality it's different than people's expectations? And if you don't, we can go on. I'd say one of the things that surprised me the most um, was that all the prisoners were Muslim. Um, it was very clear that the way they captured a lot of people were through bounties, people who were probably innocent, just as um, Andy and Stephen had said. Um, there was, it was uh, definitely different being in, in placed in Cuba itself. I think that was to uh, a kind of a power play on the U.S. part. Um, a way to show that uh, international law would be, you know, um, broken um, and used by the U.S. in any way they felt necessary in this case. Um, but yes, I feel that there are a lot of innocent people there. I feel like a lot of people wound up there in the wrong, the wrong time, wrong place, and we need to figure out how we can prevent things like this from happening again. Yeah, I just want to uh, say uh, that Guantanamo is on a piece of land in Cuba that has never been with the consent of the Cuban people since it was uh, seized in 1898. Uh, and so this is this uh, little pot patch of ground that the United States insists on preserving for whatever, originally it was a coaling station, but all of the prisoners that are at Guantanamo were apprehended uh, through a lawless invasion of U.S. forces. So in my opinion, and I, I'm a dropout lawyer, so I'm, I don't have, I'm no longer a member of the bar, but I was for many years, uh, none of those prisoners were lawfully apprehended. They were basically kidnapped. I don't care what they did in Afghanistan or Pakistan or wherever they were arrested, None of them are legitimately in Guantanamo. And I think it's important to keep that in mind that um, if anybody is a terrorist, it's the United States government with its, uh, with its public mercenary forces. <laughs> but Sarah, I think that there's a comment that Andy made that I think is worth following up on. And that was his comment about, you know, were our national leaders cynical? Did they know or not? And that was one of the questions that we were able to get at least a partial answer to during our representation of uh, our clients. And you can find in the public record a declaration, sworn statement, that we filed that was prepared by, signed by, Colin Powell, then Secretary of State's Chief of Staff. And 
what he was willing to tell us in 2009, I believe it was, was that at some of the meetings that he attended in the State Department or in the White House or in the Vice President's office, he heard our national leaders saying, we know that we are holding innocent people in Guantanamo. And that declaration, I thought, might have some effect on some of the judges uh, in, in terms of their willingness to listen to and respond to some of the arguments that we were making. It did not, but I find that a particularly you know, chilling commentary on what was going on there. And as people like to say, you can look it up. It's filed his signature uh, in the District of Columbia uh, Courthouse. So learning about that uh, from Colin Powell sounds like a specific moment in which your understanding or our collective understanding of Guantanamo changed. Learning about that makes us think, oh, maybe the government was acting differently than we thought it was. Maybe they weren't just as ignorant. Maybe it's a more cynical thing going on. I'm interested in talking about what are more specific concrete moments like that that changed your understanding of Guantanamo or fleshed out your understanding of Guantanamo that made you say either a specific case or something you learned that made you rethink what, what you thought you knew, either from a personal perspective or from a larger one. And Lily, can you check with Andy to see if he can hear that? Hey Andy, can you hear that? Um, no, I can't hear very well what's being said, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay, uh, Lily, do you want to repeat the question for me? <laughs> that was a long question, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> I can now hear very clearly. Oh, okay. Andy, we're, we're talking about what were, what were some specific concrete moments where your understanding of Guantanamo changed, either because you learned something new or met somebody new or just had a moment of realization where your understanding of Guantanamo shifted in some personal way. Did you get that? I think I mostly got that, yes. Um, well, you know, it, it was significant to me to meet some of the former prisoners, so to meet Marzan Beg and then to meet Omar de Gaias here in the UK. And, you know, I worked, I worked with Omar um, and Marzan, but, but particularly with Omar on the, on the documentary film. Um, that I made, which came out in 2009, outside the law stories from Guantanamo. Um, and that was, it was a year after Omar had been released from the prison. I, had, I didn't know how much he would want to talk. So, um, you know, I was hoping to ask him a few questions about the prisoners who at the time, the British prisoners who at the time were still in Guantanamo, which was Binyam Mohammed and Shaka Ahmed, who's still there. Um, but it turned out that Omar um, trusted me and wanted to tell me his whole story. Um, and, and I think that we were there for five hours as, as the story of everything that happened to him poured out of Omar. Um, and it was just extraordinary to have this, this intense first-person account um, uh, of you know, the depths to which he had been wronged by the United States government and the depths to which um, this, this entire war on terror um, ha had been such a horrible mistake, essentially. Um, you know, so that, that was a very important personal thing for me. But I have to say that from the moment that I began researching um, Guantanamo for, for the book, and, you know, and this is all the basis of everything that I've been doing for the last seven years, um, the transcripts of the hearings that the prisoners were allowed to have at Guantanamo, which were terrible, um, a terrible corrupt process where they weren't allowed lawyers and they weren't allowed to see or hear the classified evidence, but they were allowed to put their side of the story. In some of these accounts, which, you know, which in general were also then translated from the Arabic, um, with, it, with all of these problems, um, even so, you know, what leapt out of these pages in some cases was, were, were the clear voices of recognizable human beings. Uh, you know, sometimes with, with, with uh, great articulacy, sometimes with great indignation, sometimes with humor. Um, you know, it was astonishing uh, to me how some of these people came to life um, just through these documents. Um, you know, and then 
what was really significant to me was 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 piecing together um, elements of the story that you know that which I, I think have still not been fully explored, and I still hope to be able to do some more work on them. But of how how you know what such a great problem was the fact that um, that what the United States government was relying on as its supposed evidence was, uh, you know, these unreliable witnesses. And there was, there was a case that was uncovered by journalists in 2006, or was reported in 2006. I mean, some of the lawyers knew this, but it was a prisoner who had made allegations against dozens and dozens of other prisoners. Um, and it had come out in one of these hearings where, where a prisoner represented by, um, by a US soldier, the soldiers were appointed to represent the prisoners in these tribunals in place of a lawyer. Some of these guys took their took it seriously, some of them didn't at all. And one guy was, you know, he was, he noticed that the person he was representing was incredibly upset about accusations that were made about him being at training camps when he said he simply wasn't there at all. And he went away and looked at the files um, of who had made these allegations and saw that this guy had made allegations against, I think the figure that was quoted at the time was 60 other prisoners. Um, and that these circumstances, it turned out, were the same. That you know, that repeatedly, there were men accused of being at training camps at certain times when you know they weren't even in the country. Um, you know, so it, it, these were kind of huge things to me to understand the scale of, of, of the lies on which the supposed evidence, um, you know, was a quotable. And. Um, and, and the more time has gone on, the more that that's happened. I think it was one of the, one of the very important things in the files um, that were released by WikiLeaks in 2011, um, on which I worked as a media partner, the classified files from Guantanamo, which put names to a lot of, of these spurious allegations. Um, but, you know, as I say, I think that, you know, the full story of this has not, has not, been, um, has not been revealed. Um, you know, I would say that the majority of the American people don't know the extent to which this is a, a house of cards built on torture and lies. Um, and that, you know, and that people in the media don't know this, that I would say that, you know, that, that some lawmakers are, are still unaware of this as well. Um, and I find that very troubling because it's, it's you know, the thing that, that has probably driven me the most over all these, all these years is to understand that that actually, you know, this in many ways is a much darker story than you can imagine. Beyond the, um, you know, the stories of the torture and abuse, which, you know, have come out over the years, um, is what was the purpose to this? And the purpose to this, as I say, whether intentionally or not, was to manufacture what 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 could appear to be the evidence to justify holding these people. And That's, you know, I don't think it gets much worse than that. Andy, I've got to cut you off there to introduce um, another panelist just showed up. Uh, we welcome John Hickman, if John Hickman can hear us. Um, I can see John. Hello, John. Hello, Andy. Um, John Hickman is an associate professor of government at Barry College and the author of Selling Guantanamo. Um, John, we've been talking for about half an hour, so we're just going to jump into it and keep talking to you. But can you hear me all right? Yes, could you speak up just a bit? Sure. Um, so John, we'll just go straight to you, if that's okay with you. Um, we're talking about uh, what were moments when your understanding of Guantanamo changed? What were specific and concrete examples of things that you learned about or people that you met that altered what you thought about Guantanamo? Mm -hmm. I think from the very beginning there was something off about the uh, official explanation. I, I really, you know, from the very beginning, I think I, I, I doubted that uh, the people that were being hauled from the other side of the planet um, were being hauled there because it was such a great place to interrogate people or that they were the worst of the worst or really any of it um, to a bit, a bit unlikely. Uh, I just, I don't think I credited it from the beginning. It sounded too much like um, the, the old neocon rhetoric about uh, super predators. Uh, it turned out you know, not to be true. This turned out not to be true. These guys turned out to be rather ordinary war captives in many ways. 
Um, and what we saw was the, you know, the second Bush administration um, ginning up a story of, of there being you know, terribly threatening and so on. I, I just didn't buy it from the beginning. And you know, as I watched the story over time, it, it, you know, it fell apart. I think it's fallen apart for virtually everybody but uh, a number of Republican politicians who keep repeating that worst of the worst nonsense. Uh, I, I don't think they believe it. I think they keep saying it. Um, they have reasons to keep saying it. But I don't think they believe it. Um, I think Andy's being really generous, in a sense, when he, when, when he says that uh, they believe. I don't, you know, I don't know if they believe. I kind of doubt it, in fact. Well, thank you, John. Uh, Stephen and Brian and Brian, what were my laws of change? I, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. That's all, thank you. Yeah. All right, I guess I'm up. <laughs> I'm one of those lawyers who both loves the law and loves people. And I have to say something about each area in order to answer this question. I first became fully aware of what was going on in the law in Guantanamo when I was representing Brandon Mayfield, the Portland lawyer who was mistakenly connected to the Madrid train bombs. Because roughly two weeks before Brandon was arrested in May of 2004, I had read the accounts of the Solicitor General's argument to the U.S. Supreme Court on behalf of President Bush, in which he said that it was the Bush administration's position that our president had unlimited, unfettered, and unreviewable power to seize and detain indefinitely people anywhere in the world. That was chilling to me. I heard and read about the argument that Guantanamo was chosen as the prison to hold these men, in part because they would be able to keep the men away from lawyers. Because they knew that if lawyers were present, the lawyers would do what lawyers do, remind people of our Fifth Amendment, remind people that they have a right to keep their mouths shut. That was chilling to me. And as we went through the litigation, and I read the briefs that were filed in my cases, the briefs that were filed in the other cases, in the three cases that went to the US Supreme Court, 2004, 2006, 2008, and the briefs that have been filed by the Obama administration since then, while the Obama administration doesn't argue for quite as expansive an authority in our president, I continue to be disturbed by the assertions of power that our government is making. And that's part of the reason why in 2005 when a call came out from Washington for help in these cases, I thought it was important to volunteer our office and volunteer my time. Of course, when I say volunteer, I mean it's an add-on to our work. We were paid by you all through your taxes to do this work. The second piece of this, the human side, is this. When I went to Guantanamo for the first time in March of 2006, I had an idea by then from what I had been able to read in unclassified form that had been in the media some things about some of our clients that suggested that, you know, maybe we had some innocent guys. I didn't know that. Because, after all, as I said before, what we had all been hearing was that they were all the worst of the worst. That was not the case. The meetings with the clients in the little cells where we met were incredibly emotional. The first day of the first visit, when we got there, when we got to the base, it was dark. We were taken by military escorts to the 
combined bachelor's quarters, which was a sort of funky college dorm-like hotel where the lawyers would stay on the leeward side of the base. We'd get up in the morning and we would be taken on a school bus down to the ferry terminal to go over to the windward side, the larger part of the base where the prison was. With the military escorts driving through a little dusty town that could have been anywhere in eastern Oregon or Arizona or New Mexico. Past subdivisions with quaint names like Sunrise Terrace and Iguana Terrace. Around a bend, and we could see that first morning off in the distance the chain link and razor wire fencing of Camp Delta, which was the place where most of the men were housed in 2006. Taken to the gate at Camp Echo, where we would have our visits. Going through the rigmarole of security, but something that I'm used to going into prisons and jails. That some of the civil lawyers from some of the big firms who were volunteering, genuinely volunteering their time, were very uncomfortable. Onto the inside perimeter of Camp Echo, on a concrete walk, Camp Echo being ringed by five or six wooden structures, each with a door in front. Being escorted by our guard, Pat Ehlers and I, there that first visit to see Hadel Hassan Kamad, the hospital administrator I represented, who Andy mentioned. Other lawyers being led by their guards to other doors. The door opening for the first time that I'm there, and I look in and I see a little folding table, a chair, just like the chairs we're all sitting here tonight. A man sitting behind the table. And then I look down and see an eye hook in the floor. And see a chain attached to this eye hook, which is screwed into the floor. A chain attached to my client's leg. And proceed through the visits that morning, the afternoon, the next day, and all of the visits, all of the days with our clients sitting chained to the floor like dogs. That had an impact on me. At the end of the first visit, the second afternoon, somehow having made a connection with this man, this black man, this Muslim man from Sudan. I, a white Jew from Brooklyn, New York, transplanted to Portland. We had somehow made a connection, somehow developed some trust. Somehow we had been able to find the humanity that resides in each one of us. And when it was time to say goodbye, Pat, my assistant, shakes hands with Otto. And then I stuck out my right hand and he grabbed it. And he just stands there holding it. And then he took his left hand and he covered our right hands. And I took my left hand and I put it over his. And he stands there looking me in the eye. And then he said, Steve, when will I go home? And I said to him, Otto, all I can tell you is that we will do whatever we can to get you home to your family as soon as we can. That had an impact on me. That brought home to me as clearly as anything can, the despair that the men in that prison felt. And I can only imagine what it's like today. I haven't been there in years. We were fortunate. All of our clients were removed from the island, four sent home, two sent to third countries after we were able to have hearings for them. Today, 12 years later, 
first men, excuse me, 11 and a half, the first men were brought there in January of 2002. They're still there. And I can only imagine what those men feel, the despair that they feel, the despair that they feel when they know, at least <coughs> half of them know, that the Obama administration review teams have cleared them and said, there's no basis for us to hold you. Yet they remain in the prison because our Congress has attached to the military appropriations bills riders that prevent the expenditure of one cent to bring those men into the United States. And because our government will not send them back to countries such as Yemen and some of the other countries where there will be human rights violations that I must say we should all recognize would pale in comparison to what we do. I cannot imagine the despair that those men feel. Well, that was powerful. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, did you have something you wanted to add about a moment of change for you personally? Certainly. Well, I was there, uh, as Sarah mentioned, um, as, as they were starting sending detainees down there in January of 2001. So I got to see the process of the base change. It was a very sleepy base, and then all of a sudden it turned into um, a chaotic base with Camp X-Ray. Camp X-Ray was a terrible, terrible place. If you ever saw pictures of it, that's very much what it looked like. Um, these people were not treated fairly. Um, it was very scary for us who were serving there. We were not really allowed to talk about it. It wasn't something we could talk about. Um, but at the time, it was very hard to process, too. It was something I knew I was against. Um, but was felt very stuck and just got depressed. Um, and it wasn't until I got out of Guantanamo and I did more research that I started realizing how the government is using Guantanamo um, to blame these people for 9-11 and to um, have an excuse to go to war. Um, basically blaming these people, they're, they're scapegoats. And um, they're, a lot of these people, like it's been said, have not done anything wrong, or are, are eligible for release, and we just have not been able to do that yet. Um, the more I understand about it, the scarier it makes me about the future of policy decisions. Uh, this cannot be a precedent for the future. What struck me, uh, uh, fairly early on was that there were not going to be charges or trials for most of these uh, prisoners. And I had dropped out of being a lawyer 40 years ago because I felt even in our system that we, are, we talk about all the time has been so um, protective of due process. I felt that by, as a criminal lawyer in Washington, D.C., uh, I felt that I was just going to legitimize basic injustices that were already happened before I, before these men were in the courtroom. Uh, but they were going to have a trial. They had charges and they were going to have a trial. These men have had, for the most part, no charges and no trial, with a few exceptions. And I actually went into a period of despair over that, thinking about people who have been kidnapped from their countries had not seen their families, were not allowed any due process whatsoever, and they were stuck. And they're still stuck. Uh, and that just uh, was what overwhelmed me, uh, that um, there were these human beings who were kidnapped illegally and had no recourse to justice, except for a few like Lucky the Head, uh, Mr. Wax here to represent them, and so that was uh, that was um, just uh, I felt it was medieval. It was like the witch trials, uh, and uh, and what shocked me even more was how little the people of this country even care about it, and uh, that is what uh, has a very serious effect on my mood at times. <coughs> Well, we have about 
15 more minutes, so I wanted to ask one more question of you all and then open it up to questions from the crowd, if that sounds all right. Um, uh, I guess we should just start with, with Andy and John again, so they can hear me. Um, is, where do we go from here? How do we move forward on this? What are specific things that the Obama administration should do to close Guantanamo? There's this idea that we're stuck, that we can't do anything. We've heard it a couple times. These guys have been there for 12 years. Uh, what, what should the Obama administration be doing that we should be pushing for? So uh, how about, John, do you want to start? You can hear that. Could you hear the Sure. Part? Right. Um, you know, I, think, I think part of the problem is that from the very beginning, Obama decided that, that his campaign promise was something that he could put on hold and, and he had other fish to fry, in effect. Um, I, I think had he been more interested in kind of exposing the crimes of the previous administration instead of just uh, wishing them you know, into the past and drawing the line that they've been moving on, I, he, we wouldn't be in this position. Uh, we wouldn't be in the position of having you know, a uh, Congress that's um, constantly repeating the old, the old narrative. I think what we needed was a new narrative from the very beginning, and Obama didn't provide it. He made a promise, and then he, he wanted to forget the promise. Uh, that kind of traps the administration in a way, uh, unless it's really willing to uh, move forward with a new story about who these people are. Know, are or were when they were taken into custody. I think it's very hard to move forward. Um, we have uh, members of Congress who, you know, are, are good at basically propagating fear. Now, I think it's it's worth remembering that when we talk about you know the fear that, uh, that's induced by the prospect of moving maybe 166 people to the United States for custody. Um, during World War II, there were 425,000 Axis prisoners of war in the United States. The most dangerous people you can imagine, right? U-boat crews, uh, Rommel's Africa Corps. Uh, we're talking some, some people capable of really impressive kinds of violence. We're talking 425,000, and Americans did just fine with it. We were not afraid. And here we are, you know, in... Uh, 2013, frightened to death, apparently, by 166 guys who, by and large, were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I think we have to kind of ask why the administration isn't willing to challenge Americans to stop being fearful and start being brave again. We are capable of being brave. We have been in the past. And it's curious, politicians, uh, uh, Republican and Democrat just seem unwilling to call us to something better. I, I kind of see this as almost a, a test of our you know, national character. Who are we as a people? Why are we running so frightened? Um, and I, I can't see the Obama, Obama administration at this point challenging that fear. And I think they uh, might like to downplay it a bit. They might like to have one time go away as a problem, but they don't seem willing to, to face it or the fear that we've been living with for someone. Obama came a little bit in that moved a little bit in that direction recently when he talked about kind of declaring the war on terror ended, but he hasn't really followed through very well on that. Uh, he kind of floated the idea, and then that was it. So um, I guess I see it as part of this larger problem of us acting in an extraordinarily fearful way. And Thanks, John. Andy, do you have anything to add to that about what? Where, where, where do we go from here, specifically? Yeah. Right, where do we go from here? I, I think... Sorry, I think um, well, I wonder if Andy has anything to add to what you just said that was so beautiful. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, you know, I think, I think John has very well expressed the um, fearfulness. Um, and I think, you know, I'm not sure that, that Americans are, um, always um, realize when this fearfulness is um, particularly expressed how that is regarded outside America, and I think there are many people going, what's wrong with these guys? They pretend, you know, it's not the American people, this is American leadership. They pretend that they're the toughest guys in the world, and actually the way they're behaving is as though they're the most fearful, cowardly people that you could imagine. Um, and, you know, Guantanamo is an example of this. You know, where is 
Where is the man prepared to stand on a box and shout down his critics and say, you guys are idiots, you know, you're not only sullying our good name, but you're, you know, you're behaving as though you're scared of everything. And there's nothing to be scared of here. You know, let's face it, we've done wrong to some of these guys and they may bear us a grudge, but um, damage that we're doing to ourselves by continuing to hold them um, is more than the damage possible. Um, but, you know, we wait in vain. President Obama has finally now announced that two Algerians will be returned to Algeria. He's, in, he's told Congress that he's putting in the right application as the President of the United States to pass their, you know, their horrible restrictions on releasing anybody. That is something. Um, but, you know, there are 58 Yemenis waiting to be returned home. Um, you know, all of whom I'm, I'm pretty prepared to say uh, you know, were low-level foot soldiers at best. Uh, yeah, some of them may be a little bit annoyed about what happened to them, but I don't think it's impossible um, for for a certain amount of monitoring to take place. And as I say, the rest of them say, "What do you expect?" You know, um, you release people from prison, some of them commit crimes again. Um, only the most ludicrous, ludicrously deranged right wing of the right wing would suggest that the best thing to do with people in prison is never to release any of them, because that way you aren't going to get any recidivism. Uh, you know, that's a fantasy of, of the farest far right that I can imagine. Um, but, you know, that's the, the, when it comes to Guantanamo, that's the way that we're being told reality operates. You know, we, we can't release anybody because a single person uh, being, being upset about what happened to them and doing something about it is intolerable. Um, I just wonder why why the children are operating all the uh, devices of government here, where the adults are, because they seem to be. <laughs> so you know, as for what we can do, we're going to have to you know, after summer when we all get the chance to uh, to recover a bit from the hard work that those of us who care about this have been doing for months. Now you know, when the prisoners gave us the opportunity to wake the world's media to this again, because. They embarked on a hunger strike, risking their lives. And you know, and President Obama has made some nice speeches for the stone brain. We're going to have to take the fight to him again in September and say, you know, you you've just got to find some some bravery and release these people. You know, the the short term political inconvenience of having to argue with lunatic Republicans and even lunatic members of your own party. You know, that's really not very significant in the long run, Mr. President. You know, the only thing that counts is that this place is closed. That really is the only thing that counts. Is that this abomination, this moral, legal, and ethical abomination is closed, and we can all say, that was terrible. Please, let's not do that again. Thank you, Andy. Ideas about where should we go from here in terms of how do we actually close Guantanamo? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, well, uh, you're, you're senior, please. Well, there is such a thing as a bully pulpit. pulpit. Now, I don't have no illusions that Obama is going mm -hmm. to exercise uh, the bully pulpit. He could travel around the country and constantly be talking about the the immorality and illegality of this whole saga. Um, but I think short of a popular uprising in the United States, nothing is going to change. I think it really does come down to a popular movement uh, that will obstruct business as usual in the United States. Uh, the Occupy movement was a, um, a actual very interesting and development that took the system by surprise, not just in the United States, but in the world, but it terrified them. Is they cannot stand any kind of popular uh, movement uh, that threatens their power. But we do, if we, if we want to survive as a species, it seems to me that we do need to discover our empowerment and collectively with others decide that we are not going to allow our lawless, immoral government continue to uh, run over us and run over the rest of the world. Uh, 
I love to be the most conservative person. <laughs> Don't despair is the message that I'd like to leave people with. Don't succumb to fear has been said. Take action. Things such as this evening are critical. And everyone in this room has a voice. Everyone in this room can get on his or her own bully pulpit. I say don't despair in particular for this reason. Because whenever I get angriest about some of the things that my government does in my name, I remember this. And I encourage everyone in the room to remember this. My government, your government, your tax dollars, pay for the work that I have done. Our government unleashed me through its dollars without fettering me in any way from my colleagues in other defender offices to fight it to use all the legal tools at our disposal to fight it on the most fundamental issues of our day. That is something that I think we all must remember. However bad it seems, however bad it is, whatever need there may be for the type of action that Brian has talked about, we should not forget that we are still a truly unique country where the government pays one of its employees to tell it in the most direct way possible, you are wrong, change your behavior. And that's what I've been spending my time doing when I've been working on the Guantanamo cases in representing the individuals here in Portland and in Eugene and in Ashland who have been charged with terrorism, national security types of offenses. That's something that I treasure and that I will continue to treasure and I guess that's why I still wear the suit of the lawyer and you have two people who went through the legal system and have taken two different perspectives but I think that we are fighting for the same ends in different ways.